Bruce Feldman, senior college football writer and columnist for TheAthletic.com, joins us on 365 Sports. Bruce, always great to have you on the show. I noticed the note, uh, the, the article about Michael Penix Jr., who had a spectacular year, could have won the Heisman Trophy, played for the national title. And, and what draft, their, draft experts are telling you uh, of why he can become, well, maybe as successful in college or not. Yeah, he's, it's really all over the board with him. I mean, he's the most polarizing quarterback in this draft class. Um, he's had four season-ending injuries back in his time in Indiana, had two remarkable seasons in a row for Washington, almost won the Heisman. Um, and so he's a guy that, that a lot of scouts we talk to think has the, is the best deep ball thrower and downfield thrower in the draft, which is a big statement. Um, and so... You know, one of the points and I, you know, some of the guys I talked to, who, you know, who are in the draft process or have been um, made the point that because he's been through so much adversity and, and really come through it so, so strongly, um, they would like his chances to succeed in the NFL where Daniel Jeremiah, who's like the NFL Network's lead draft scout, the former scout, told me, when you look back at all the quarterbacks over the last like 20 years, the number one factor of the ones who have busted, and it's a big percentage of how many times the NFL gets it wrong, the biggest factor he has seen is guys who fail to deal with adversity and for one reason or another just can't can't bounce back. And Penix, to his credit, has shown he absolutely can do that. Bruce, um, he had three fantastic, well, probably more, I mean, really more than that, but three stud wide receivers, including Roma Dunze this year. But um, how different would their stories be without Michael Penix? Because he just seemed to be able to do things that most quarterbacks can't do. Like the the Roma Dunze, like we need a third and 11 and they get 18 yards on the most beautiful pass ever. It was a regular thing for the Huskies this year. Oh, no doubt. I mean, it was... uh it was a big deal to have to have that guy because look, this was one of the worst offenses in college football till Michael Penix was running it. And obviously some of that, a big part of that was Kalen DeBoer going in there and Ryan Grubb, the offense coordinator who DeBoer brought with him, now to Alabama, but they went from like 115th to like in the top five. Um, and that was, the receivers were there. The offensive line was younger, but it was largely there. It was the big change was the trigger man and the, and the system he was running. Bruce, we went from what was a relatively quiet coaching carousel as the season was winding down and ending to then just massive decisions with Saban's retirement and then subsequently Jim Harbaugh this week. Is this you know, a more significant time period than most other years because of the stature of those guys? Or do you think this is just kind of business as usual? What kind of a void do you see being left uh, with those two departures in particular? Yeah, I absolutely think it's a much, much, um, because, you know, certainly because of Harbaugh, you know, he just won the national title. He's, he's the rare coach who came from college football who is a, proven track record of being a really good NFL head coach. I mean, he's a guy that came close to winning a Super Bowl. I mean, with the 49ers. And so I think the fact that, you know, it was expected that he was going to go, but until he did, I think that is one thing. So you have that job is still open. You know, we think that they will promote Sharon more up into that job permanently, but you know, that's a big factor. And then I obviously had, to lose the greatest coach of all time in college football, Nick Saban, to retire. And then all of a sudden the domino effect that happened, not just Kellen DeBoer leaving and then Washington's open. And then because of that, Arizona's open. And because of that, San Jose State's open. And because the DeBoer hire happens, you know, he ends up hiring two sitting head coaches. So those two jobs come open. Bruce, is there any doubt it all seems to be pointing that way with Sharon Moore, but is there is there any way it doesn't end up being him? I think it's a long shot that that it wouldn't be. I mean, he's not just a guy who's revered inside the program, but also he was the guy who took over for Jim Harbaugh when the Big Ten suspended him, and so it wasn't like just like he was the interim head coach. He was the interim head coach who was thrown into the to the to the spotlight 
less than 24 hours before they played on the road against Penn State, won that. They won their, you know, their trap game that they had against Maryland the following week. And then the next week was the huge game against their arch rival, Ohio State, and they won that. I mean, I don't think you could have a guy who's, who's never officially been a head coach have a stronger case than Sharon Moore does for this job. Bruce Feldman with us, theathletic.com on 365 Sports. What do you think about his ability to recruit to the level that, I mean, he's been helping Jim Harbaugh do that, obviously, but that Jim Harbaugh was doing at Michigan, which, again, they're not a top five regular class, but um, Jim Harbaugh and that staff seem to have an eye for talent that they could develop really well and fit. They absolutely do. I mean, you see what they've done. You know, a lot of times it wasn't top, top three, top four, top five classes. But they know how to develop players. I think they did have a good eye for for guys who they thought had the determination, the physicality, the toughness, and that was really the backbone of this team that won a national title. It wasn't like, oh, we're loaded with five star guys coming in. There's a few of them, but not many. It's really you know high level three star, four star guys who just grinded away. It was old style, physical, tough football. And I think ultimately, like Sharon Moore knew, you know, and saw what Jim Harbaugh, you know, wanted. I mean, Jim Harbaugh was a, was a former quarterback who's wired like a middle linebacker. And we saw what he was able to do at Stanford. I mean, people may have forgotten this, but like when he took over at Stanford, it was the worst power conference program. And it took him just a couple of years to turn into the bully of the West Coast but, and into a top five team before he left to go to the to the NFL. Wasn't that why his quarterback at Michigan this year was really something that he had kind of this special relationship like most coaches do with the quarterback, but he kind of had that middle linebacker type mentality too. He did. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, you go back to that Penn state game, you know, they struggled a little bit dealing with, um, you know, dealing with, with the pressure and the edge rushers that, that Penn state had, and ultimately, you know, Sharon Moore ran the ball 32 times in a row, and nobody was happier about it than his quarterback. And J.J. McCarthy, who's a really talented kid, but he was like, listen, this is what, you know, this is what we what our, our, our blueprint, blueprint is. We're going to be the more physical team. And sure enough, it worked out great. Bruce, we know there's a ton of issues in college football right now. I mean, you can make a laundry list of them all. Um, and right now, it seems like there's a lot of guys that we're seeing landing on their third school, fourth school in the transfer portal. But we're also seeing a lot of sixth, seventh, eighth, even in the case of one Miami guy, ninth-year players. I was just curious, for the players who are exhausting their eligibility, where does that sort of fall on the list of, uh, I guess, coaches and their discussions about things that they are not – great with or, or things that, that bother them about the current model. I'm sorry, say the beginning part again and cut out on me for a second. Yeah, so there's a, a bit of a log jam, as we know, because of the COVID year and all those things. Where does the fact that mm-hmm. we've got a glut of a lot of sixth, seventh, eighth, even in the case of one Miami player, ninth year players, where does that sort of fall on, I guess, the issues list for coaches right now, knowing they have 100 issues on their plate at the moment? Yeah, I think the hardest thing for them is the roster management piece going on. You know, in the calendar, to be honest, and, and so much stuff is, is is jammed together. And again, like a lot of people aren't going to, you know, what was me for for uh, for <laughs> the college football coaches, and you know, some are making you know millions and millions of dollars. But I think the logistical part of this is still a challenge. And I think you know, it's probably mind blowing to see. Cam McCormick is a ninth-year senior going to be at Miami. And you have um, Alan Bowman, who's a seventh year, going to be a seventh-year guy at Texas at, – at, I'm sorry, at Oklahoma State. He started out at Texas Tech. And it feels like these guys have been out, around there forever. And in some cases, they, they pretty much have. Um, but I think, look, you know, because of NIL, I think some of these guys are, are doing very well. Some of them are getting, you know, a lot of advanced degrees. And ultimately, I think that, you know, while that, while it may seem really weird, I think there's a lot of good that can come with it, too. 
Bruce, um, you wrote a fantastic book called Kane Mutiny uh, years ago about Miami, and they are so far from that book right now comparatively to what they were when it came out. Uh, but they just got Cam Ward. Mario Cristobal is there. They seem to have given him a long leash to figure out what what they are now, like how who they can be. Can they be that again? Is Cam Ward the spark that they need to get back to being who they were? I think he's the spark they need to take the next big step. You know, they took a step from a really rough first year to this year. They weren't great. I mean, they lost to Rutgers in the bowl game. That's, you know, no matter how improved Rutgers is, it's still a pretty average team at best out of the Big Ten. Um, but they were struggling at quarterback. And I think Cam Ward, who obviously people around there know, and some of them will remember from his incarnate word days where he threw the ball all over the place with, Eric Morris and was really prolific and blossomed there. And, um, you know, I, I think he's very talented. He's, as, he's probably as good as Miami's had there in that position in a while. He's going to play behind a really talented offensive line. They have a couple of good receivers. I think this team will be a, will take another big step forward. I don't, I mean, to, not to, to push off your question, but like, you got to be a top 20 team before you can be a, uh, title team or, or a team that even thinks of it, right? Like they got to, they got to get to be pretty good before they can get to be very good. And I do think Cam Ward can help them to that. Um, like I said, they have some talent around them, but they haven't won. And, you know, on the offensive line, they could be really, really good. And that's, a, you know, as we see with Michigan, as we saw with Washington, that's a great building block, but now they need to surround them with better players on the defense. They have some, you know, they have a handful of the guys that can can lay the foundation to getting Cristobal to where he wants to go. You know, they have one of the best young defensive line defensive linemen in all of college football. They have arguably the most talented uh, offensive tackle in college football. Those guys came in as true freshmen and lived up to the hype. Now they need Cam Ward to really help light the spark of a team that really needed some leadership in the locker room. Quite honestly. Bruce, last thing, you write a lot of features, columns, and, and cover, and you're, you know, of course, on television, too. What you do with uh, helping run the athletic.com, do you have a list like coaches or eight, like ADs do? If they have a coach leave, they have to have three or four or five names on a little small sheet. Do you have a constant churning of story ideas? And how often do they just get wiped out because of then something that currently occurs? Yes, and it happens quite a bit. Like right now, there's something I'm working on, and there's another story that I kind of, when I say committed to, told my editors, hey, I want to do this, and it becomes a lower priority. It gets pushed to the back burner, um, and that that happens. I mean, that's a good problem to have. You know, hopefully you're not making the people you talk to, you know, kind of wait for a story. You took their time up and, you know, for that. But, you know, like college football – I mean, I love what I get to do. I love how we, you know, the system we have at the athletic, we have a lot of really good writers and editors to work with. And I feel like there's a lot of people, um, you know, you can talk about story ideas about and it's fun. I mean, I, you know, we have such a great sport to cover. I know there's a lot of times where we talk about stuff that's kind of like sometimes makes people cringe or people are like, yeah, this is wrong. This needs to be fixed. But there's just so many great things. I mean, uh, you know, a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned Alan Bowman. And in the uh, um, in the last summer, he and a bunch of his receivers from Oklahoma State came out here to Southern California to train with George Whitfield. And I remember spending the day with them. And not just Alan Bowman, a couple of the receivers were so impressive, you know, not just on the field, but when you talk to them and hear their stories. And, like, I got a ton of respect for, you know, Alan um, you know, he's got this great business degree that he got from Michigan when he when he was the third string guy. He decided mm -hmm. to stay there because he wanted to get this, you know, this business degree, which is like, you know, I think sometimes we forget because we just watch these guys on the field that there's really some, you know, remarkable people, really impressive young guys behind them. And so to get to tell those stories is, is you know, I feel like something that's like a privilege to do that. Bruce, as always, thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Uh, the Athletic, Bruce Feldman, senior columnist and writer for TheAthletic.com, and always a great guest to get.